Welcome to the WTF video series here on Z Statistics. It's a quick and intuitive look at some of the most important concepts in stats, and it's a pretty good place to start if you've just begun dealing with the subject matter. In this video, we're WTFing the normal distribution. Now you've probably seen this bell curved shape before, but what is it and why is it so important in statistics? Why does it always pop up? Well, let's have a quick look at the definition. Here's some nerdy as hell equation called the probability distribution function. And all this does is define the bell curve's shape. It defines the height at every value of x. That's all this does. And you're never really going to need to use the equation. But what we can take from it is that that bell curve we just saw is defined for a given combination of mu and sigma. So in this equation, there's only really two parameters mu being the mean or the middle of the distribution and sigma being the standard deviation, the spread. So where does this bell curve pop up in real life? Let's have a look at some examples. The first example is the flight that I took from Sydney to Los Angeles. Now how long does such a flight take? Well, I looked it up because I couldn't remember but apparently it takes about 14.5 hours. But you can appreciate it might be longer or shorter than that depending on delays or wind interference. Most likely, the flight's going to be around 14.5 hours. So it's probably quite unlikely to take 13 hours and quite unlikely to take 16 hours. But you can see that there's still some likelihood in these eventual times that this flight will take. As another example, Let's look at the heights in a classroom. Most people are around the same height, let's say around 175 centimetres, but we know that there are a few people who are really small and also a handful of others that are really annoying to stand behind in concerts. Both of these distributions could be defined by normal distributions. You can see the first one has the mean of 14.5 hours and a standard deviation, let's say, of 0.5 hours. And the second one, has a mean of 175 centimetres and a standard deviation of 10 centimetres. Now these are both normal distributions. They've just got different parameters. Now you can appreciate that these are both simple examples that are not very realistic. And I'm sure a few of you are thinking that heights and flight times aren't really normally distributed. And you'd probably be right. So it's perhaps a bit of a simplification. Here's a statistical reason for the prevalence of the normal distribution in nature. There's something called the central limit theorem, which is a really simple concept. Think about flipping a coin, Her Majesty's 20 cent piece here. If I was to flip it once, the distribution of the probable number of heads would absolutely not be a normal distribution. You can see I can, I can toss one head or I can toss zero heads, both of which have a 50% probability. But what happens when I flip Her Majesty's coin more than once? Here I have two coin tosses. I can get zero, one, or two heads. Here I have 10 coin tosses. I can get up to 10 heads. And now let's have a look at 50 coin tosses. Does that look familiar to you at all? You'd be forgiven for thinking that's a normal distribution. Here's another example where the starting distribution is completely lopsided. Consider the probability of rolling a six with one roll of a dice. Obviously, you're more likely not to roll a 6, but you've still got a probability of approximately 17% of rolling a 6. Now, watch what happens when you roll more dice and try to assess the number of 6s that you're likely to roll. Here we have two dice rolls. Again, clearly not a normal distribution. 10 dice rolls and 50 dice rolls. Not only is this distribution now a lot more symmetrical than we started with, but you can see it's approaching something that looks pretty normal. And this is an extremely useful property in statistics and it's used all the time. So this is the reason for the prevalence of the normal distribution. And realistically, it's the reason why the normal distribution is so prevalent in natural phenomena, like my trip to Los Angeles or the heights in a classroom. Simply stated, the central limit theorem says that as n increases, the distribution of the sample mean or the sum 
approaches a normal distribution. In these cases, we were looking at the sum, but also if you took the mean of my number of rolls or the mean of the number of heads, that distribution would also be approaching a normal one. All right, so let's go back to the definition because there's something we haven't quite dealt with yet. You've heard of this thing called a standard normal distribution. What's that about? Well, it's a very particular normal distribution where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Note that the variance is also one. I'll let you figure out why. Looking at this distribution, we can see that there's a 50% probability of a given selection from this distribution being less than zero. You can appreciate that this curve is symmetrical, so the probability of taking a selection from this distribution and it being less than zero would be 50%. Equally, the probability of selecting a value greater than zero would also be 50%. We analogize the probability to the proportion of the area under the curve. With this standard normal distribution, we can also find more interesting probabilities, such as the probability of getting a value less than minus one, or the probability of getting a value greater than 1.645, which is in this case, 5%. How do we find these particular values? Well, we use that relatively hideous table that I'm sure you're familiar with if you've already sat a few of your classes in statistics. What this table essentially does is uses that formula that we saw right back at the beginning, but it does it for us. So we don't have to worry about that formula really ever. But the tables are provided only for the standard normal distribution. So the distribution where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. For any other distribution, we're going to have to convert it to a standard normal score first. So let's take our heights in a classroom example. The mean was 175 centimetres and the standard deviation was 10 centimetres. What if I asked you to find the probability of finding a student taller than 190 centimetres? Unfortunately, we don't have a table for that particular combination of mean and standard deviation. So the first thing we do is convert that 190 to the corresponding point on the standard normal distribution. This formula helps us get there. We take the x value, or the value that we were interested in, in our heights distribution, which was 190, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and we get a z score, it's called a z score, of 1.5. And this z score of 1.5 is exactly the same point on this distribution as 190 was on the original distribution. So that area above 1.5 is exactly the same area above 190 on the previous distribution. And we can find using our tables that it's 0.067, that particular area. So the probability of Z being greater than 1.5 is 6.7%. The probability of our height being greater than 190 is also 6.7%. So that's the probability of finding someone that's greater than 190 centimetres in that particular class. Now there are many more ways you can use the standard normal distribution. You can find a particular value of x for a particular probability, but this was just one example. And I hope that this has given you some kind of background as to what the normal distribution is and how it's used in practice. My name is Justin Zeltzer for zstatistics.com.